Hello, this is Lucas G. Bianchi, and this video is about the use of comic book imagery in the pop art movement. I will be analyzing two of Roy Lichtenstein's paintings, Drowning Girl, made in 1963, and Wham!, also made in 1963, two works that appropriate imagery from comic books made during that time. And I will be also going over the comics that were used as reference, which are Secret Hearts, issue number 83, and All American Men of War, issue number 89, respectively, and compare how close his paintings are to the original works. Uh, to start, the pop art is defined that a uh, fine art that uses imagery found in popular culture. Anything that's consumed by the population in mass, like advertisements, comic books, and even images found on packaging, cans, and other sorts of stuff like bottles were used. The actual movement lasted between the mid-1950s and ended in the late 1970s, only first gaining traction due to the recent economic boom coming out of World War II, leading to a general increased production of all sorts sorts of commercial products, but it didn't come out of nowhere, as the pop art movement shared philosophies from previous art movements shared as modernism and, in particular, data, as they all rejected the traditional way of art as society developed further. Pop art can actually be interpreted as a direct evolution of data, an art movement that started in 1916 and ended in 1924, whose intent was to call into question many different aspects of art itself, such as its purpose and how society should perceive it. And similar to pop art, data used pre-made imagery through the use of ready-mades, or objects that were bought and presented without much modification. An extreme example was this fountain made in 1917 that was just a urinal with a signature. But while data used pre-made objects to add to their work, pop art used pre-made imagery and styles and modified them to their liking. So the pop art movement was fundamentally the use of imagery found in low art in the making of high art. High art can be described as a piece with high quality, aesthetically pleasing visuals and has enough effort into it, while low art is basically anything that can be mass produced for a general audience. By using imagery associated in lower forms of art in high art, the pop art movement challenged the preconceived notions of what can be considered fine art while also parroting it. Roy Lichtenstein was a prolific American pop artist primarily known for his style of painting, which resembles comic books. He was actually one of the first of the people that popularized the pop art genre art during the movement, starting his art career being inspired by the movements of the 1940s, such as Abstract Expressionism. It was only in 1961 with the creation of works such as Look Mickey was when he adopted the style he's known for today. While all of Lichtenstein's later works were inspired by comics one way or another, some were very liberal with their use of comic book imagery. Those works had basically replicated certain comic panels with only enough differences for it not to be called a direct copy. Call it an appropriation or an artistic reproduction, the original inspiration should be known. To start, Drowning Girl, made in 1963, is a painting that depicts a woman struggling against the chaotic waves that surround her with a look of despair on her face. Accompanying her is a thought bottle, which is a staple for showing internal thoughts in comics, with the dialogue, I do not care, I'd rather sink than call Brad for help, implying there was something going on between the two that is not shown to the viewer. As for the original inspiration, it came from the DC series Secret Hearts, which was a romance anthology comic published between 1949 and 1971, specifically issue 83, which was published in 1962 and illustrated by Tony Abruzzo, as it copies uh, the splash page, which is just basically a page of a comic book that consists of a single panel for the short story Run for Love. A brief synopsis of Run for Love is that the main lead, Vicky Brownie, she has a series of encounters with a man constantly getting into trouble. It was only when Vicky was drowning in the ocean due to a sudden and paralyzing cramp was when it gets to the scene that's depicted right now, where Vicky is drowning while the man looks on from a flipped over boat. For how close uh, the artworks made by Abruzzo and Lichtenstein are, there are a lot of subtle differences to show the disparity between the mediums of pen and ink and painting. For starters, the composition of the painting removes the top half of the comic's artwork in order to focus more on Vicky's herself. The lines are more solid in the painting while thinner in the comic. Colors are slightly different with the comic boasting overall more vibrant colors while the painting has less variation in the waves that surround Vicky. The painting still preserves the movement found in the waves as conveyed through the lines, but is also weakened a bit due to the lack of speed line hatching that was found in the original artwork. 
Speed lines are usually what you use to indicate fast movement, after all, in comics. Vicky's internal dialogue is also slightly different, with the painting removing if I have a cramp to increase the dramatic effect of the words. It also alters the meaning of the painting, as Vicky is now not drowning out of pure pettiness, and instead gives off feelings of hopelessness and heartbreak as if this and Brad had a history together. This is a far cry from the original story in which Vicky had only met the man the day before. Lichtenstein's Drowning Girl emulated Bruiser works to a great extent, but he had changed it well enough to change the meaning entirely. For Lichtenstein's second painting, WHAM! depicts two planes in an aerial dogfight. The plane on the right was hit by a missile, engulfing it in a thick, saturated explosion as the bottom half of it is shredded to pieces. Accompanying the explosion is a giant yell on a Bonapia, which says WHAM, providing the painting not only in its title, but also emphasizing the impact of the explosion. Another thing to note is the narration in the top left corner, which says, I press the fire control, and ahead of me, rockets glaze through the sky. This painting's inspiration came from DC Comics' All-American Men of War, which was another anthology series, but about American war stories, issue 89, which was published in 1962 and illustrated by Irv Norvik. Uh, the panel was found in the story The Star Jockey, with the main protagonist, Johnny Cloud, fighting in a series of aerial battles as he tries to destroy a hidden missile silo. The panel in question comes from at the height of his second battle with the enemy as he hits one of the planes coming after him with a missile. Um, the differences between Lichtenstein's and Novik's art styles are very similar to one in found in Drowning Girl, as the painting focused on a specific part of the comic while leaving everything else out. The comic prefers hatch lines, while the painting preferred solid black for shading. The colors are more vibrant in the comic, while the painting has more saturation. Lichtenstein prefers to keep every color contained in the line work, while the comic is more haphazard with its coloring. A line of action that is found in both the comics and the painting is portrayed through the missile, which the painting has it to be more horizontal, while the comic is more diagonal. The only thing that's missing from the painting is the dialogue, the mountain in the bottom left corner, and an additional whoosh on a monopia below the plane. While in the original comic, Cloud hitting the plane with a missile was only the start of the conflict, Lichtenstein's painting gave the feeling that this came at the climax of the battle when one side was finally able to land a serious hit on the other. The silence from the pilot further emphasizes the weight of the situation. Similar to Drowning Girl, Lichtenstein used a lot of elements found in Irv Norwich's words for WHAM! Not outright copying, but using it as a base for the style of his own work. One final thing to note is that the colors and textures of both the comic and Lichtenstein's works are conveyed through stippling or ordered dots. Specifically, it's replicating the Ben Day process, a printing technique developed by illustrator Benjamin Henry Day Jr. in 1979 that was often used in producing colored comic books. Similar techniques have been used in high art during the post-impressionism movement, using pure colored dots that mixed together when viewed from afar. Here, in George Seurat's Parade de Secu in 1887 or 1888, you can see the dot-based painting technique shares a semblance to the Bende printing style found in All-American War, issue 89. While there are semblances to Seurat's and Lichtenstein's styles through the use of dots for color, Lichtenstein favored more saturated and simple colors in order for more accurate comic replication. In conclusion, while Roy Lichtenstein may have copied parts of works done by artists Tony Abruzzo and Irv Norwick, enough differences were made for Lichtenstein's own style and motions to sign through. That's what pop art is, the use of popular imagery to convey the artistic message. And that movement in general is not just stealing imagery, but a celebration of the work put into popular media at the time, even if indirectly.